In this segment, I would like to explain uh, the most fundamental basics of population genetics, um, which uh, are essential to understand uh, how uh, we all differ in our genetic variation and why that came about. So I'm going to talk about these three main topics, address these three main topics. First of all, I want to understand in the end uh, the amount of genetic variation that we all carry. Um, and then understand why we carry that amount of variation. And later on, how much of that variation is functionally relevant. Uh, that will actually be in the next segment and not in this one. But that's the whole point here. Because if we don't understand how the genetic variation in our population came about, then we don't really understand how it's functionally relevant. And I'm going to reverse the order here just a little bit and first go into population genetic th theory um, to uh, explain um, how a particular amount of genetic variation comes about and is, is carried in the population. So here are the main, uh, the main contributing phenomena to population genetics. And we already talked about mutation. Mutation is the ultimate source of variation. And uh, just to be very clear about this, um, imagine for a moment that um, the DNA in us, um, in you and me and our brothers and sisters and everybody, is exactly the same. Okay, Imagine that for a moment. It's exactly the same. We would all look alike. And uh, we will all be extremely similar. We will be uh, as similar as monozygotic twins. Um, actually, we would be even more similar in the sense that uh, monozygotic twins have genetic variation from mom and dad. It's just that they carry the same variation. Whereas if we were all completely identical, then we would have no variation. And we would be looking exactly the same, acting similarly, et cetera modulo the environmental influences, of course. So taking that as a straw man, um, imagine what that would be like. We, you know, there, there wouldn't be any phenotypic variation. Now, the fact is that we all do differ. And we differ because mutations happened in the past. And the mutation became genetic variation that now segregates in the population. So the ultimate source of our variation is mutation. And every single variant started as a mutation in a single cell that was then passed on to the next generation. So if we were all the same, we would still be humans. And in fact, our shared biology is uh, largely the same. It's just tweaked a little bit here and there uh, by genetic variation. So once a mutation appears, that mutation um, is subject to dynamics of, uh, in, in population uh, history. And the dynamics uh, can be relatively easily explained as changes in allele frequencies and how prevalent the variation, the variant, is in the population. Um, and the allele frequency here is, is caused by different samplings, if you will. Uh, by drift and selection, and I will explain that in a moment. So that's how allele frequencies change over generations. And then the variation itself, because we're, we have variants along the chromosome in different places of the chromosome, um, is, is, has an arrangement with respect to one another. And that is uh, called linkage. And of course, linkage is broken up by recombination through the generations. Um, and then finally, there is a geographic distribution of variation. Uh, population subdivision uh, on the one hand versus migration uh, from populations um, on the other. So the, these are the main phenomena. The source of variation, then how the variation behaves over the generations within the population, and how the population is structured to uh, facilitate, if you will, uh, the flow of the variation. Now note that um, none of this has anything to do with biological macromolecules. And it has everything to do with how uh, 
the information is sampled from one generation to the next. So we're not going to be talking about macromolecules at all uh, in the next segment. Okay, first we need to understand what is allele frequency. And so I've drawn out a few small populations. Uh, let's say that this is the ninja population. And parent of this ninja here had a mutation in their germline. And so this ninja is the first one to carry that variation. So what is the frequency of that mutant allele? Is it one in 100? Not quite. It's actually one in 200 because only one of his chromosomes has the mutation. The other chromosome came from the other parent and doesn't have the mutation. And of course, none of these guys have the mutation, but they all have two chromosomes. So there is 100 individuals where diploid, 200 chromosomes. And so the frequency of that new mutation is 1 over 200. And um, I, I should note that the term chromosome in this context uh, refers to uh, the, uh, the different, uh, you know, the, refers to the same place in the genome, but the different versions of it, if you will. So um, it's, uh, you know, I don't mean chromosome 1 versus chromosome 2 versus chromosome 3. I mean there are uh, 200 chromosomes 1 and 200 chromosomes 2, et cetera, uh, in this population. And if there is one change in one of the base pairs and, uh, in, in one of those chromosomes, the allele frequency for that locus is 1 in, in 200. So uh, in a larger population, that initial allele frequency would, of course, be 1 in 2,000. There is 1,000 individuals here, and so now the allele frequency is 1 in 2,000. Um, perhaps after a little while, um, oh, in general, a new mutation in a diploid population has a frequency of 1 over 2n, where n is the population size. So after a while, maybe uh, you know, a couple of generations went on, and this mutation was lucky enough to be passed on to a couple of people. So after a while, there's three people in the population that have the mutation. And so the allele frequency here would be 3 out of 2,000. Now, what if 503 out of these 1,000 people have the allele? Well, now the allele frequency is so high that actually some of them are going to be homozygotes. In other words, they received a copy of that allele from both the mom and the dad, and they now have both chromosomes carry that allele, both the maternal and the paternal. And just as an aside, uh, this is the whole subject of the Hardy-Weinberg Hardy equilibrium. I'm not going to get into that because it's not all that important. All I want to point out is once the frequency of an allele rises to a particular point, um, the chance that somebody is homozygous for that allele uh, increases. And so uh, you can work that out with math. But basically, here the allele frequency is not just 503 out of 2,000, it is considerably higher than that because these guys have two of, of each of those alleles. Um, so here's just the allele frequency definition, if you will. Um, it's for this particular example, we have a G and an A polymorphism, GA polymorphism. Uh, the allele frequency of this derived allele is the number of Gs in the population divided by the number of all alleles at that site. And uh, basically, that reminds me to mention that when you talk about allele frequencies, uh, it really doesn't matter that somebody has two chromosomes. Uh, we are just sort of bags of chromosomes. When we talk about allele frequencies, uh, we consider each chromosome separately. Um, and the fact that we have two each is, is just peripheral, really. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have a sample of 100 people uh, and you're interested in the frequency of a particular allele, then you have 200 chromosomes that you consider. You don't actually go in and consider each person with their two alleles separately. You just sum it all up. So 
um, the number of Gs divided by the total number of chromosomes that you've sampled. And again, for, for most chromosomes, except the sex chromosomes, that's twice the number of individuals that you've sampled. Um, another definition. So we've already talked about the derived allele. Uh, we are, uh, in most positions in the genome, everybody has the same base pair. Uh, when there's a polymorphism that arises, then uh, that, makes a, that makes a variant. Uh, previous evolutionary events were also polymorphisms, um, but these became fixed. In other words, uh, if this was the ancestral sequence here, G, A, T, T, A, C, A, and uh, there was a polymorphism in an in, in ancestral population, um, that polymorphism may have gone on to become fixed and become an evolutionary change. So now we have G, A, T, A, and this A is carried by all of us. That's not polymorphic anymore. So evolution is basically a product of um, polymorphism turnover. At any rate, uh, this would be a site where we have variation in our population now, and this would be a site where we don't have variation anymore. There used to be variation, but that's now gone, and everybody has the same base pair. So uh, MAF stands for minor allele frequency, minor allele frequency. And I've drawn out 20 chromosomes. It doesn't matter how we sampled them, but they probably came from 10 people, but it doesn't matter. I've drawn out 20 chromosomes and uh, a stretch of perhaps 200 base pairs. Uh, it's not that pretty, I'm sorry, but uh, so I've, uh, these brackets here are just 50 or 25 base pairs of identical sequence, just so that we have the variants that are in these, in these chromosomes a little bit closer together and we can see them better. So uh, we have 18 Ts and two Cs. Um, the T is more frequent, and that's the major allele. The C is less frequent, and that's the minor allele. So what is the minor allele frequency at, at this locus here? It's 0.1, 2 out of 20. At this uh, variant here, the minor allele frequency is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 out of 20, so 0.3. And here, the minor allele frequency is 1, 2, 3, 4 A's out of total of 20, and that's uh, 0.2. Okay, so that's the minor allele frequency. So uh, the obvious is, in this case, the allele frequencies are estimates because they are based on a sample of 20 chromosomes. This may be, in the end, correct or incorrect as far as the population that you're interested in or the whole human species is concerned. Um, so allele frequency estimates are always based on samples, but these days samples are getting to be very, very large, and our allele frequency estimates tend to be very, very uh, accurate, um, as I will get to uh, later. So then um, there's another term called the derived allele frequency, and as you can see, I've colored uh, the variants here blue or red. And what, is, what that is supposed to indicate is that uh, the blue one is the ancestral allele, and the red one is the derived allele. So the one that was a mutation in somebody back when, and then it came to higher frequency. And so here, the derived allele has actually gone to higher frequency than the ancestral allele. And so the derived allele frequency is, is, uh, is actually the major allele frequency. So minor allele frequency versus derived allele frequency are two metrics that population geneticists use. Uh, most of the time, we're just talking about minor allele frequency. And uh, the reason we don't talk about major allele frequency is because that's the same. It's just one minus the minor allele frequency. Most places are biallelic. So minor allele frequency is sort of the more important uh, point. And that would be point two here. And it would be actually the same as the derived allele frequency because that's the derived allele. And that is, in fact, the case. Um, most of the time, the minor allele is the derived allele. And so minor and derived allele frequency for any given locus is probably, not always, but probably the same. OK, so the frequency of a brand new allele is 1 over 2n. 
we were just we just went over that. Um, now the questions are: Is it guaranteed if there's a new allele? Is it guaranteed to become more prevalent as the generations go on? What is the probability that its frequency reaches some kind of a threshold at some point? And, and I've just picked an arbitrary threshold here of 0.5. What is the probability that its frequency keeps increasing? And how long will it take to reach that frequency? So these are sort of key questions that, uh, that if answered, give us a sense of what our variation, how our variation arose um, over the generations. So is it guaranteed to become more prevalent as the generations go on, and how long does it take to reach a certain frequency? Key questions. And the two forces that determine those questions are uh, drift and selection. Drift is the change in allele frequencies due to sampling. Um, and uh, that sampling is, uh, happens particularly on neutral variation that has no phenotypic effect. It is stochastic, so it's basically sampling from one generation to the next. And I will show you cartoons that hopefully explain that. Um, the, the main important piece here is that a lot of our variation has no effect and therefore is neutral. And because it is neutral, it is subject to only drift, the sampling process. Now, if the variation has an effect, it's possible that it is subject to so-called selection, natural selection. Natural selection is basically the change of allele frequency uh, based on uh, function, on the functional impact of the variant. And in that sense, it is deterministic. If it's advantageous, if it produces a reproductive or viability advantage, it will rise in frequency. If it's deleterious, it will decline in frequency. And that's the sort of the deterministic aspect. But there's an interesting interplay between these two that we will talk about um, that makes it not quite as clear cut as stochastic and deterministic. So let me start by explaining drift, and then we'll talk about selection. So first, uh, the sampling of alleles from one generation to the next. Uh, just, to, just to get us thinking about it, let's imagine that there's a family, uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my dad, and then uh, my brothers. And we, of course, all have Y chromosomes because we're male. And let's just imagine that in the germline of my great-grandfather, there was a mutation on the Y chromosome. Um, and I have no uh, specific knowledge of such a mutation, but I can guarantee you that there was one because the rates of mutations are such that, that there was probably a new mutation on my great-grandfather's on my grandfather's Y chromosome. And because it's on the Y chromosome, he's passed on to, to my dad, right? Um, and then my dad had two sons, Henning and myself. And so uh, the frequency of this uh, allele doubled in this generation, right? Simply because of chance, because my dad had two sons and only one daughter, right? But then both my brother and me had only daughters. And so that variant is lost. No more variant. It, it's gone. So this sampling process changes allele frequencies. And once uh, an allele is lost, you're not going to get it back. Because remember, mutations are independent. And one mutation has nothing to do with another mutation. So the new allele stayed at the same frequency in the population, because there was one son here. But then it doubled, because there were two sons. But then it went extinct. And so that sampling process plays out, not just on the Y chromosome, but everywhere with all new mutations and with existing allelic, allelic variation. So let's go over some key facts that I will uh, explain in greater detail. So we're only looking at neutral variation for the moment. And for ease of discussions, we're going to talk about a single nucleotide variant, a SNP. Um, but the concepts are true for any 
type of variant for any mobile element insertion or deletion or rearrangement or whatever. Um, it's just easier to talk about SNPs. Let's remember that people don't hand alleles to other people. If you're in a population right now and you have a mutation, there's no way that you can hand it off to your sister or to your friend or whoever. It's just in you and nowhere else. Allele frequency changes are due to sampling from one generation to the next. And therefore, changes occur from one generation to uh, another generation. And the other thing to remember is that allele frequency changes from just one generation to the next probably don't change things all that much. But because our population history is so deep, you know, human generation time is 25 years or something, so 10,000 years in the past is 400 generations. Over the course of many hundred, many thousand generations, many million perhaps, changes can really add up, really add up. Okay, so what is the actual reason for the sampling process? There are two reasons. One is that the per-child gamete sampling is such that the child gets only one of the two alleles from dad and only one of the two alleles from mom. Okay, so you're sampling one out of two from dad and one out of two from mom. That's the first sampling. And then the next sampling is that people have different number of kids that survive and uh, that survive to, to reproductive age. So those are the fundamentals of the sampling process. And then the unit of time is generation. Uh, and uh, generation is, is sort of a, uh, a loose word here. Uh, in population genetics, of course, the models are, are mathematical. And so you model generations as very strict, you know, one generation to the next, and so forth and so forth. Of course, humans are messy. Any species is much messier than that. You can't really tell whether somebody is Gen X or Gen Y, or you know, how many parents they had, I mean, uh, how many kids they had, and when they had them, and so forth. But over time, these sorts of things tend to average out. And so it's um, not inappropriate to simply think about one generation to the next, even though we're all offset in one way or another from one another. OK, now here we have two people, one male, one female. And they are both heterozygous for an allele. Uh, the, Red dot is the G, and the blue dot is the A. And I'm show only showing that one allele, that one variant with the two alleles, excuse me. So they're both heterozygous. Uh, the fact that they are, the dots are arranged in different uh, sequence doesn't matter. So blue, red, red, blue, the same thing. Okay. So when they have kids, they've sampled, right? Um, w for each kid, one from mom, one from dad. Um, and they, had, they happen to have three kids. So this is the fundamentals of the sampling. Pick one allele from each parent, and then how many kids you have. That's the sampling. And you can see that in this cartoon example, the allele frequency changed from them to their kids. So now we have one, two, three, four orange. And you can see that the allele frequency changed uh, from the parents to the kids. So here the parents were 50-50. Uh, two orange, two blue, but the kids have four orange and two blue. So that's just chance. And now let's imagine that we have a population of 10 people, because 10 is easy to look at. The same principles hold true in a population of a million or a billion. And we started out with an allele frequency of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Ah, 50 50. In the next generation, that may change. So how many do we have now? How many of the blue balls? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight A's and 12 G's. So the allele frequency changed. And then in the next generation, it may change even further. Perhaps now we only have one, two, three, four, five, six out of 20. So 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. In a different population, and of course, a different allele, a different mutation. But let's just say, you know, same 50-50. Uh, it might go the other way. Maybe the A allele goes up in frequency. And another mutation, maybe 
the G allele goes up in frequency, and maybe over the generations, actually, the G allele is lost, and A is now present in all of these. Okay, so that is genetic drift. Allele frequencies due to sampling from one generation to the next. A key point is that the frequencies change more dramatically from generation to generation when the population sizes are small. So I actually gave you a population of 10, and it only took two generations to appreciably change the OE frequency. If I had given you a population of 1,000, the OE frequency changes wouldn't be so fast and so dramatic, but they could still happen over more generations. I've just given you a small population to illustrate this. But the fact is that frequency changes happen quickly in small populations and slowly in large populations. Drift is more effective in small populations. Now, there is a subtle uh, uh, distinction that one might make between population size and the census population size, or how many people are there, versus um, the population size that is really relevant for standing genetic variation and for the spread of variation in the population. And um, that leads to the concept of effective population size. So three examples um, how demographics and other things uh, change the behavior of allele frequencies in the population because the population size is not the census population size. It is uh, usually smaller than the census population size. So if you have unequal numbers of males and females, so here's the bull, okay, that um, sires uh, calves uh, in many, many female, many, many cows. See what you're doing. You're always sampling from the same individual, and therefore, uh, it has sort of an outsized impact on the next generation in terms of how you sample from that. So unequal numbers of reproducing males and females drive down the effective population size. And if you do the math on this, if you have one bull mating with a thousand cows, um, that, is this, that is not a population size of 1,000 or 1,001. That is much more like a population size of four individuals. So that means that allele frequency changes happen much, much more quickly than you would think, simply because you have that vast difference in the number of reproducing males and females. So that's one example. Um, population, population size fluctuations with bottlenecks uh, also decrease the effective population size. And this is incredibly relevant to our human history because only recently, and I will show you graphs later on, only recently have we grown to be six or seven billion people. Most of our evolutionary history mulled along in the hundreds and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands with population size changes, expansions and bottlenecks. And when you have a bottleneck the effective population size, in other words, the behavior of the alleles from generation to generation is much more like a small population than a large population. So population size fluctuations and bottlenecks are very important here. And then finally, you have population subdivision. That gives me an opportunity to, to mention, we always talk about populations. Uh, what does that really mean? It's really mostly in the eye of the beholder. Um, a global population like humans or global species like humans, you could think of as, ha as having sort of discrete populations. Um, and that's to some extent true. And again, I will show you later how population subdivision is kind of interesting in that regard. Um, but overall, there's still migration and gene flow. And so you could consider the whole human species as one population, if that is what your question is about. Or you could go in very specifically into a subset of the human species, uh, let's say an island population, to take an extreme example. And you will find very interesting things going on with that island population that has to do with genetic, genetic variation just um, that's specific to that island. 
Um, so the population subdivision and uh, the, the, um, the preferential mating of uh, individuals within a population and the low rates of migration between populations also lead to um, something that is more like a smaller overall population size. So effective population size is the term that I'll be using from now on. Um, so all these phenomena make it so that the effective population size is smaller than the census size. Uh, the effect of that is less variation and uh, for reasons that I will get into. And in humans, our global effective population size is much more like 10 to 50,000 than 6 billion. In other words, the variation we carry um, behaves as though we are a uh, much smaller population, the variation that we carry that is common to the human population. Um, and only the most recent variation is a reflection of our very large population size that we have now. Okay, um, two quick uh, asides. Um, what is the probability of an allele eventually becoming the allele that everybody carries? So drifting up in frequency over many, many, many generations and eventually replacing the ancestral allele. What's the probability? Uh, it's the allele's frequency. So in other words, a new allele has with a frequency of 1 over 2n, remember, has a chance of 1 over 2n to become eventually the only allele, to fix, quote unquote. Um, so that means that that probability is not zero. A new allele actually has a chance of becoming the major allele and eventually going to fixation over the course of many, many generations. Um, but now consider an allele that's at 50%, and this is quite intuitive, so over the course of the next generations, either one of the two alleles, which are you know, the ancestral alleles at 50%, the derived alleles at 50%, either one of those has a chance, has an equal chance of going to fixation, right, eventually. And in fact, one of them will. It's a given. Eventually, the new allele will either go away or it will drift up in frequency and replace the old allele eventually over the course of many, many generations. In the meantime, you have the variation in the population. So what's the average time to fixation? Um, if the allele frequency is very high, the average time to fixation is short. If the allele frequency is low, the average time to fixation is long. And it's again a, f a, a, a function of population size. So in small populations, an allele can drift to fixation very quickly. In large populations, an allele takes a longer time to drift to fixation. So, summary genetic drift. Drift removes variation because sampling alleles from one generation to the next is guaranteed to change their frequencies. And if an allele is not sampled in the next generation, it is lost. So drift removes variation. Mutation puts in variation. Drift removes it. New mutations add variation, and they're not doomed simply because they have a low frequency. They have a finite probability of going to higher frequency over the generations and a limit becoming fixed. And population size determines the time range and the speed of drifts sampling actions. At population size of 10,000, drift acts 100 times faster than at the population size of a million. So um, just as an aside, uh, this is the danger behind uh, population bottlenecks in wild populations. If it's an endangered species where only 100 are left in the wild, if uh, they breed uh, over the next few generations, drift makes it so that they keep losing variation. And in the end, um, they have then very, very low genetic variation. If the, uh, if the low population, if the uh, uh, small population size persists over several generations, there's constant loss of variation. 
Okay, now let's talk about selection, where the change in allele frequency is because of function. Selection is a uh, term that is bandied about a lot, and it's usually not in the correct context. So let me show you this cartoon here. So mom has several hundred kids, and then uh, the predators come along, and only one of them survives. And so from one generation to the next, you keep population size constant, more or less. Um, and uh, you get from a very large number of kids, which is what most species do, to back to you know, replacement rate, basically. Now, the cruel world here is not selection. Um, it is just killing, if you will. Um, and, and so the, uh, the absolute fitness, the viability here of uh, one out of a million kids um, is the probability of survival until the mean reproductive age. But here fitness and the, the fitness is not what determines selection. If the fitness depends on genotype, if there is an allele that con confers a greater number of offspring or more viable offspring, then you have natural selection. The cruel world alone is not selection. And population geneticists have come up with a parameter called S, the selection coefficient, to quantify the advantage or disadvantage that an allele might have, um, and uh, which then leads to allele frequency increases or allele frequency decreases. Because what the allele does is it has a function and if the function is advantageous, it will cause there to be more viable uh, offspring. Or if the function is deleterious, offspring probably aren't, aren't as viable and won't reproduce as well. So I want to explain S, the selection coefficient. <clears throat> so let's say that this is um, an advantageous allele in the population. It's present at some low frequency. Again, here we have you know, mom and dad. Um, and I still want you to imagine just a single locus with two alleles. Uh, because of this selective advantage, its frequency goes up in the next generation, and it goes up further in the next generation. And it can be slow. So here we have 2 out of 20, 3 out of 20, 5 out of 20. So that's fairly slow. Or it can be quicker, 2 out of 20, 5 out of 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 out of 20. OK, so slow rise in allele frequency, fast rise in allele frequency. Uh, the intuition here is simply, if it's a slow rise, it's probably not conferring as much of a selective advantage as if it is a, a quick rise in allele frequency. And the selection coefficient S quantifies the speed at which these things happen. In other words, it quantifies the selective advantage conferred by that single um, allele. It ranges from 0 to 1 or from 0 to minus 1. And negative S is deleterious, so it, it will decrease in frequency. The positive S is advantageous, so allele will increase in frequency. Um, the time over which these dramatic over which dramatic allele frequencies uh, change is on the order of one over s generations. So let's say that an allele confers such an advantage that um, instead of having instead of a hundred parents having a hundred kids, a hundred parents carrying that allele have a hundred and one kids. That's a selection coefficient of 1%. In order to get dramatic allele frequency changes, that has to happen over a number of generations. And that number of generations on the order of the inverse of that. So if it's a 1% advantage, it'll take approximately 100 generations for there to be real frequency changes. If it's only a 1 in 1,000 advantage, it will take maybe 1,000 generations for there to be a real frequency change. Now, one thing to remember about uh, 
selected alleles is that highly advantageous alleles come about rarely. And uh, that's largely because, for one thing, we are walking, talking humans that actually function well. And so our state, if you will, is already highly optimized in some ways. And so improving upon that further is uh, difficult. Whereas deleterious alleles happen often, but they get eliminated quickly because those deleterious alleles um, don't uh, help in reproduction or viability. So let me give you two scenarios uh, for allele frequency changes under selection. Uh, S greater than zero, the allele frequency increases every generation. As less than zero, the allele frequency decreases in every generation, right? So advantage, disadvantage. So this would imply that the better allele always wins and eventually gets fixed. And so evolution marches on to ever greater perfection, right? So if a selectively advantageous allele comes along, it uh, spreads through the population over the generations and becomes fixed. And so we get better and better and better all the time. <clears throat> um, but that's not true. So why is it not true? It's because selection and drift are in a tug of war, depending on population size and the advantage or disadvantage that the allele provides. So when you are a large population, so here we have 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, when you have a large population and a relatively large selection coefficient, so here we have 10%, 1, 1%, uh, 1, 1 in 1,000, and so forth. So here's the large selection coefficients. These are the small selection coefficients. So selection is strong here. Selection is weak over here. When you are in a large population with relatively large selection coefficients, selection wins out. But if the selection coefficient is relatively small and you're in a smaller population, drift wins out. And so here, the sampling dominates. Alleles with small functional effect are still subject to drift. And selection can't really overcome that very effectively. But it turns out in large populations, selection is stronger. So that means that a large portion of selectively advantageous alleles might actually behave in an effectively neutral manner. And uh, that's the basic explanation why organisms can't be perfect. Okay? If it was always selection, then we'd be perfect in the end, uh, you know, given, the envir given no environmental changes. But uh, because of this issue here, you always have slightly deleterious mutations segregating in the population, and you can't really get rid of them. So around the diagonal here, where the inverse of the uh, population size is close to the absolute value of s, so 100 population size of 100, and an s of 1%, um, that's where they sort of battle it out. But over here, drift wins and in large populations with large selection coefficients, the selection wins. OK, now here is the conceptual framework for how drift and selection interplay at one particular locus. And it's basically just the flow chart. So we have a lesion or a mutation that gets passed on to the next generation. Then you ask yourself, does it cause an impaired or improved or novel molecular function? Does it improve protein function? Does it uh, decrease gene expression? Does it, you know, any kind of effect you might imagine that's a molecular effect? Does it do that? If it has no molecular effect under any circumstance, it is guaranteed to be neutral, and it's therefore select, subject to drift only. <clears throat> 
but it might have a molecular effect. Most mutations um, don't have a molecular effect. But if they do have a molecular effect, then we ask, does it affect a cell biological or higher order organismal process? If the answer to that is no, then the allele is subject to drift only. If the answer is yes, then we ask, is there an organismal phenotype? So in other words, um, is, does the mutation uh, that has a molecular uh, effect and affects a cell biological process, does it actually matter to the organism? If it doesn't matter to the organism, then there can't possibly be an effect on viability or reproduction, and therefore it is no. But if there is an organismal phenotype, then we are in the realm of the fitness effect versus population size. Now, maybe the organismal phenotype is a very subtle one, and so the fitness effect is not particularly large, and the population size is perhaps also not that large. If that's the case, then even though there is an organismal phenotype, the allele behaves neutral. If the fitness effect is large enough given the population size, then we have changes in allele frequency. If it's an advantageous allele, then it rises in frequency. If it's a deleterious allele, it um, uh, decreases in, fre in frequency. So you can ask yourself, you know, for every allele that you find, it, is this the case? And uh, you can just see by this that the vast majority of human genetic variation is going to be largely affected by sampling as opposed to functional effects. But of course, that amount of variation that does have a functional effect is the interesting part. So the neutral variation helps us understand our population history. This helps us understand our differences in physiology and disease. So let me give you one example of um, a particularly interesting uh, case of natural selection that happened in the human population that we can, we can infer from our current population level data. Um, and that is the example of lactose intolerance. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, some of us uh, can't metabolize lactose. We, if we drink milk, uh, uh, bad things happen. Um, and that tends to be the case as we grow older. So um, the reason uh, for this is that uh, lactose present in milk is a sugar very closely related to glucose, except a little bit different because it's a disaccharide, a disugar. Um, that has uh, one glucose uh, part, and instead of a fructose part, which would make sucrose, plant sugar, it actually has a galactose, so the OH here is in a slightly different place. And there's an enzyme that is required to break down this disaccharide to these two so that these two can then go on into the meta metabolic pathways to make energy out of. This alone really has to be broken down if it doesn't get broken down, then it passes unscathed through the upper intestine and your gut bacteria go nuts over such excellent food. And that's what causes the distress. So lactase, this enzyme here, is critical. Now what happens uh, in human physiology? Let's say that this is a lactase gene, and here's RNA polymerase ready to transcribe the lactase gene. And there's another gene over here, it's irrelevant. Um, so what happens uh, in, ch in children that drink milk <coughs> is um, regulatory elements interact with the promoter, and lactase transcripts are made, and from these transcripts, lactase protein is made, and then when lactase protein is made, the lactose sugar is broken down. So that's how it should happen while nursing and perhaps uh, slightly later ages while, while drinking milk. After weaning, what happens is that there is a particular regulatory uh, mechanism that turns off 
uh, the interaction of these regulators with the promoter. And uh, basically, there's a protein that's hypothetical as yet, but um, there's a protein that binds here and, uh, and turns it off. So as you grow older, um, this regulatory mechanism kicks in, and no lactase is produced. <clears throat> when you have the lactose-tolerant allele here in the lactase gene, <clears throat> that repressor doesn't bind. And so what you have is lactase persistence. It keeps being turned on, uh, even as you go older. So this C to T polymorphism here determines lactose tolerance or lactose intolerance. So this, the, um, the ancestral state in most human populations, and now I want you to think back uh, about 12,000 years or so to uh, the time when uh, humans had spread all over the globe, but our ancestry uh, was still uh, you know, our ethnic ancestry. So in North America right now, lots and lots of people are lactose tolerant because they derive from European ancestors, right? Um, and most of, back in 10,000 10, years ago or so, most of the world, um, there was no lactose tolerance. After weaning, lactase would get turned off. <clears throat> Only in Europe began this uh, allele to emerge. Now, why is that? First of all, why is the lactose, uh, why, why is the lactase gene turn off after weaning? Well, of course, this is, milk is good for the next generation, right? But if there's competing interests, uh, this situation is really, really bad for the next generation. And so, he really, really isn't supposed to be drinking milk in this uh, tribal context. But if we invent dairy farming, uh, that's actually good for the next generation. So when dairy farming was invented, lactose was one of the nutrients in milk that even older people uh, would, would, uh, would utilize. And so then it became advantageous for lactose, uh, for lactase to persist, and and for the older older generation to uh, to actually be able to digest uh, lactose. So, population modeling suggests that approximately ten thousand or so years ago, in some place in Central Europe, this allele first appeared. And uh, so here we are, three hundred and sixty generations in the past. Um, and now the colored dots mean that the allele frequency is going up in various places. And this is spotty because the visualization of it is, is not perfect. This is, of course, there's variation. So what this means is that the allele is spreading through the population over the course of 100 or so, 150 generations to become a little more prevalent. So this is perhaps 200 generations ago. And it keeps spreading, and now we are uh, in a place where most of Great Britain um, has uh, the lactase persistence allele almost fixed. Much of Central Europe has it at a very high frequency. And uh, other outlying areas, including the rest of the world, don't have it at all. So this is because dairy farming was invented, and all of a sudden that persistence allele provided a very strong selective advantage and people estimate that it's on the order of 1%. You know, one more child out of, two, out of 100 uh, in every generation. Now, you see that the rest of the world doesn't have it. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the case for most of the rest of the world. Although in Africa, where there's independent evolutions of dairy farming, you have actually some other alleles, not this exact allele, but others that um, have arisen and that also provide lactase persistence. So that is one example, one of the very few examples of very recent, very strong positive selection in the human population. So let's 
summarize this briefly, a mutation in a regulatory element that occurred about 15,000 years ago conferred persistence of lactase expression beyond weaning. It's at that point not disadvantageous anymore um, because of the dairy supply and there is no competition um, between adults and babies for milk. In fact, it's advantageous because it makes more efficient use of dairy products by adults. It spread through Central Europe over the course of a few hundred generations. And uh, as I mentioned, there is lactase persistence in parts of Africa, that's, though that's likely different mutations.